Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Oxford Sparks live Q&A as part of our Science at Home campaign. If you've never been with us before, then please consider subscribing as you'll be the first to know when all of our new animations and indeed these live Q&As happen. Um, said it's a live Q&A and that means you get to ask your questions. So as we're talking, feel free to shove your questions in the chat box, we'll put them to the researchers. And I guess I should tell you who's with us today. So we are joined by a couple of uh, PhD students in the Earth Sciences Department here at the University of Oxford. Uh, and they're off studying earthquakes and, and the earth beneath our feet. But in their spare time, they're writing musicals about science. It's pretty cool, yeah? If technology uh, is with us today, then hopefully we'll get a song or two. Um, but if not, we'll have a really great live Q&A. So I'm really happy to introduce Roberta, Roberta and Matthew. Hello. Hello. Hey. Thanks for joining us. How are you on this excellent day? Good, good. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. So I guess first things first, I kind of alluded to a little bit, but maybe you could start us off by just telling us a little bit um, about what you're studying as part of your PhDs. Roberta, do you want to start? Yeah, so earthquakes and faulting in the continents. And um, part of my work is to understand really quite old earthquakes. So I'm talking kind of ones that happened 100 years ago to thousands of years ago. And earthquakes occur um, when the stresses build up in rocks and they become so high that the rock breaks. I've got a little bit of a cardboard to help explain here. So they break along uh, fracture surfaces that we call fault planes and the rocks slip past each other like this. And they move so fast past each other that they release loads of energy and that produces seismic waves, which is the shaking. But I don't actually study those. Um, because uh, I, I study I study continental interiors uh, where everything moves a little bit more slowly. So um, lots of people know about earthquakes that might happen on the plate boundaries, like for example in Nepal, where the Indian plate is smashing into Asia. And the earthquakes there can be very big and they happen very frequently. But as we move further into the continents and to a bit of Central Asia that I study in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Because everything's moving a bit more slowly, these earthquakes do happen, these really big earthquakes, but they're much more infrequent. And that means that these big faults that produce them are much more difficult to identify and to monitor because they don't really produce a lot of kind of seismic activity, for example. Mm. Um, but all hope is not lost. So we can study kind of earthquakes that happened a long time ago. And we can do that because when these earthquakes rupture, sometimes they, they break the surface and they leave these big scars in the landscape. Okay. Um, and we call these fault scarps. And if we can map them out and kind of take samples of the rocks and the sediments that are associated with them and date those, we can start to build up really good pictures of kind of when these old earthquakes might have happened, how big they might be. And then that tells us about the kind of hazard that these faults might pose to nearby populations now. Yeah, so... Uh, uh how are you actually going about like studying? Are you going out into the field? Are you looking at satellite imagery? What are you doing? Yeah, I do a mixture of both of those things. So um, I do do field work. So I'll go into the field in say Kazakhstan and go to these faults and we use loads of different techniques. So we fly drones over the faults and then we can use those drones to reconstruct the um, shape of the landscape and then make really detailed uh, measurements of the offsets that have happened in these earthquakes and that tells us about the size of the earthquakes. But another thing we do um, is we can dig big holes in the ground um, and so if, you, if we take our kind of offset uh, rock we can kind of dig, if we can kind of dig a trench across this fault, mm. um, then we expose these offset layers. And by dating them and measuring the offsets, we can kind of piece together a story of what might have happened. But we also do use satellite measurements. So I also work on satellite radar um, and, and, and look at those images and, and analyze them. And that tells us kind of how the earth is moving and deforming under our feet. Because mm, I, mm, I think it must be quite hard to try and identify where some of these things are if you've got these big tracts of land. Uh, so presumably that helps to pinpoint where those are. Definitely we can use optical satellite imagery 
to kind of pick out where these where these faults might be. But of course, you make a really good point that it can be so difficult to to find them because if these earthquakes happened um, thousands of years ago, then maybe the evidence from them has been eroded from the landscape entirely. So it can be really tricky and you're kind of lucky to be able to find a good fault scarp. Yeah, so have you done a fair bit of um, excavation work and and stuff like that? Yeah, so we dug um, one of these, they're called paleo-seismic trenches, um, across a fault in Kazakhstan uh, last summer um, and like kind of discovered and excavated some old earthquakes and so that will hopefully be really useful um, and we're, we're kind of in discussions with the, the local scientists there who kind of talk to the local government and that will hopefully help inform them to understand their seismic hazard. Yeah so what what is it from old earthquakes that help in terms of uh hazard planning and and such like is it just better understanding where these things are that can help or the severity of earthquakes what's what can you yeah learn? yeah so we can kind of work out where the faults are so that's important because you might want to uh, you might have a canal that goes across your your fault line so you might want to know about where it is or, or a pipeline that's carrying water or, or something else um or and you might want to know how big the earthquake could be and therefore why how strong or, or well built your buildings need to be and mm. um, but in these places in particular it's really important because um you know in in Kazakhstan for example they haven't necessarily had lots of big earthquakes within living memory so people might not be as prepared as they are say in California where there's a lot more of an awareness of these mm. earthquakes and a lot more studying of them so by looking at the old earthquakes, we can kind of bring attention to that and, and bring more information to the table. Yeah, so there is more. More information is more helpful. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for covering that. And I guess we should say hello to Matthew and find out what you're up to. So tell us a bit about what you do. Hello. Yes. Um, so sort of. Uh, taking on from uh, Roberta's talk of earthquakes, I uh, use those seismic waves which uh, are generated by the earthquake, these vibrations of the earth, to try and find out what's going on hundreds of kilometres beneath our feet. Um, because trying to work out what's going on down there is quite complicated and com- a bit difficult because we can't actually sort of go down there ourselves. Uh, we can dig about 10 kilometres down, but then it gets a bit hot and a bit pressurised and stuff and we can't really go much further. So we need something else which can travel down there and that type of thing are these seismic waves, these vibrations. They travel down into the deep, they pass through all of these interesting structures and then they appear back up at the surface and we can detect them using seismometers which are these sort of measurement devices which record these little wiggles and by analysing those wiggles, we can try and tell the story of the journey that that seismic wave went on from the earthquake, where it was generated, all the way through those structures, and then appearing at the seismometer. Now, what kind of structures would I want to look at? I think I'd like to look at some si- uh, some subducting slabs. So these Tell are... us about what they are. <laughs> yes, uh, a weird word, subducting slab. Now, they are these tectonic plates. So the surface of the earth is sort of cracked into all these tectonic plates. And when one collides with another, it can subduct, it can descend underneath into the mantle. And these are called subducting slabs. And um, I think they're really important to look at in places such as Alaska, uh, which is my chosen area of research. Now, why Alaska? I hear you, Aska. Um, it, <laughs> um, Good <what> one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alaska is quite complicated, whereas the rest of North America is this big blob of stuff which has stayed the same for a very long time. Alaska is actually made up of lots of different islands, which used to be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but then they all got smushed into the side of North America. And all of those islands were on little tectonic plates And when they collided with North America, they descended down into the deep. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do a very holistic study using geophysical seismology methods to image those slabs that are now in the deep. And then using geological methods to look at those all those little bits of islands which make up the mosaic that is Alaska. And then trying to turn back time to work out which island was on which plate back in the past. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. 
sounds really fascinating. Uh, when you say sort of geophysics and imaging and things like that, are you, is this stuff that's underwater? Like, tell us a bit about what you're actually doing there. So um, the the seismometers that I'm using um, are mainly sort of in Alaska. It's very useful at the moment because um, there's this seismic array called the US array, which has been sort of marching across North America for the, um, or the United States of America over the last uh, decade or so. And over the last few years, it's all, all of them have come to um, Alaska, which has been great. So we've got loads more data all at these seismometers. And um, there, but there are some sort of ocean bottom seismometers, as they're called, uh, which uh, are sort of on the bottom of the ocean, as the name suggests. Um, but uh, there's lots of difficulties with them because often the, um, the the water sort of sloshing around it does create lots of other vibrations as well. And so, yeah, you need a slightly different seismic sort of uh, processing techniques to look at them. Yeah, and so I take it when you're looking for these these wiggles, these seismic waves. Um, it's not like you're treating the earth like a big bell and you're creating them, I assume. But are you are you waiting for natural processes and then trying to use them to do your analysis? Yes, um, th there are ways of uh, creating seismic waves, but the deep stuff that we're trying to look at, um, we need massive earthquakes that happen in, in places like uh, that Robert is looking at. And um, the sort of seismic data over the last few years uh, there's been enough earthquakes really that have happened that have sent seismic waves through the areas that I need to look at that it's actually okay but we still have um, good data sets from other seismometers uh, in back into um, sort of the 20th century um, but not that far back into it. And, and is this all part and parcel of just generally better understanding the earth's formation or are there ways that we can use this information in the future or like what, what's your overarching kind of aim with your research? So uh, I mean it may seem a bit odd what why am I trying to work out what how Alaska formed uh, as interesting as that is as a sort of thought experiment um, and I, I guess in some ways the method of combining sort of geophysical seismology studies, looking at those slabs in the deep, and combining that with geology and paleomagnetism. I didn't mention that before, but we use sort of like these little magnetic GPSs to try and work out where things were uh, sort of formed in the past. Combining all these different techniques um, is a sort of a relatively new technique, um, and uh, we're sort of trying to see if that works and if that works well then other people across the world can apply it to lots of different areas um, but these big sort of tectonic processes uh, formations of continents they are very important for so many things that go on on the surface all these sort of things going on in the deep they have a big effect on the surface so the uh, tectonic movements of plates they can create massive mountains and those mountains can then change the way that the atmosphere moves around mm. and um, it can if you if you imagine though when Alaska was uh, not even Alaska all those little islands there would have been oceans between those islands but when all of the islands then got smushed into the side of Alaska all those oceans got collapsed in so the ocean circulation is now uh, mm. completely changed as well and if the ocean circulation has changed then that will change the amount of biological processes that are going on in different places so I, I think I mean the wonderful thing about earth sciences is that everything is linked together everything is important and by sort of studying one aspect it can sometimes lead to interesting things in other aspects. Wow Cool, thank you. Well, um, I think now would be a nice time to, to talk about some music. Before that, just a little reminder for those watching that if you have any questions at all for Roberta and Matthew, then uh, chuck them in the chat box on the side there. Um, so let's talk about science musicals. So uh, you, you two have created something called uh, Geologize Theatre. Tell me a bit about that. About that. Um, well, we just really love science and we love performing and theatre and singing. And so we kind of merged it all together in one. And it kind of all started, um, we, we did our undergraduate uh, degrees together and we were doing field work together and uh, we were sort of stuck on the side of a mountain for a very long time. <laughs> 
and there were lots of long walks and also some kind of scary animals hiding in the bushes so we did a lot of singing to kind of ward off those animals <laughs> and it sort of spiraled from that that was when we first started singing together and we're both really interested in kind of story and narrative um, and Matthew's a very excellent musician um, and uh, I kind of sing a bit and so we we kind of put that together and and we there were certain things that we we found interesting when we were doing our undergraduate degrees that we thought were lent themselves naturally to story so um, the thing that we we ended up writing our, our kind of first big musical about um, was What Killed the Dinosaurs. That's the title of the musical. And we just thought that the story of that discovery was so um, interesting as a narrative. And also it had um, like such interesting characters. Like there's this father and son team called Louis and Walter Alvarez that that discovered um, that they, they put forward this idea that the meteorite had, had killed the dinosaurs. And so we thought, what an amazing opportunity to play these different characters. Um, but yeah, maybe, I think we've got a good internet connection. We do, so. it looks like it. So we'll get a bit of a song. Yeah, so I think Matthew, um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to sing uh, together because um, of all the technical problems with being in different places. But yeah. um, I think Matthew can maybe sing a little a little snippet from uh, the first song in our musical what killed the dinosaurs okay here we go they first appeared a long time ago back in the triassic they started to grow you gotta love these awesome reptiles they have evolved a brand new hip style The creatures that came before them had legs sprawling out to the sides But dinos have the limbs to beneath them, see how they stride You've gotta love the dinosaurs Those T-Rex teeth and iguanodon claws Some just eat meat whilst others are herbivores Some grew to a massive size up into the skies you've got to love those dinosaurs hey yeah you really do have to love those dinosaurs that's really great so have you you've performed this uh to various audiences where where have you taken this yeah so we've been um we sort of started off with a proto version uh, where we were um, at university previously. And then um, since we've been in Oxford, we've done, I think, three performances at the um, Museum of Natural History in Oxford in their big lecture theatre there. And um, yeah, we did a few back in March last year and then uh, and, and a couple in May. And um, yeah, uh, it's been it's been really good fun. It's predominantly aimed at sort of kids and families. Yeah. Uh, so for the whole sort of family to come along and uh, we play these sort of geological detectives in the geological investigations department trying to uncover these cold cases of uh, <laughs> what killed the dinosaurs and um, all the kids and families in the audience they are our new recruits helping us on this journey so there's a, a lot of sort of interaction and things like that. Sounds really fun um, but also presumably really informative uh, uh yeah like what what is it do you think about songs and music and story that helps unlock science for a lot of people um well i mean aside from the fact that it's just like we hope entertaining and, and fun to listen to and engaging um we found it to be really useful um as a tool to kind of explain the more kind of complex um, concepts so we'll like explain we'll have a scene where we explain um, something and then we'll kind of have written a song about it and we hope it kind of sticks in people's heads and consolidates it and you know you can use repetition and rhyme you know I um, the best that like when I did well in my exams I'd like written little rhymes about um, things to kind of help me remember it so we hope that 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 helps but we also think that kind of when we all were learning science, like from being in school, um, going up through to university, like we're both scientists, but we absolutely love story and theatre. And we didn't kind of think that there necessarily had to be a separation and that like one could feed mm. into the other. 
and they do seem to work quite well. But actually, I think Maggie can possibly demonstrate another song that we we did um, possibly here um, because we one of the ways we use the songs um, is we kind of like to write them like a set of instructions. So we we wrote a, a whole piece about kind of how fossils are formed um, and. Uh, we found initially that it was kind of a bit of a dead bit in our show. Like we we couldn't kind of necessarily hold the attention of the kids. So instead we added a song to it. And <laughs> Matthew's going to play you a little bit of that now. Cool. Here we go. Uh... How do you form a fossil? How do you form a fossil? Step one, your dino dies, covered in sand right where it lies. Step two, more sand on top, it's buried and squashed to form a rock. Step three, minerals replace the bones that were once in that space. Step four, the fossils rise, we wait a while for a prize. How do you form a fossil? That's how you form a fossil. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, do you find it really easy to just come up with these excellent verses and rhymes and everything? It sounds like it, it would, I mean, I can't write any song, let alone a science song. So uh, what, are, what are some of the challenges or is it just super easy for you guys? Are you just naturals? Well, I guess there's the, there's the sort of music writing process itself, um, which mm -hmm. I think we, we sort of, People often ask us, like, do you write, and I think people would ask anyone who writes songs in any way, do you like write the lyrics first or do you write the music mm -hmm. first? And I think what we do is we work out what the song vaguely needs to be about. And then we just come up with the sort of the little hook, which is both the word itself or the phrase and the music. So like, how do you form a fossil or what really killed the dinosaurs? And we just, that sort of, comes in in one of our sort of you know uh, story writing um sort of processes and then from that we usually sort of build the music out from there and uh, get sort of the tunes and the chords and all of that sort of musical bit and then go through and uh, try and fit all the words in um but fitting which particular words in is quite difficult and i think roberta will say a bit well, about that I I think I think one of the big challenges that we always face with this, and I think anyone who does science communication will have experienced this, is trying to condense like really complex scientific ideas into both a short space of time or into kind of um, a, a constrained or structured medium. And whether that's because you have had to give a talk about your science and it was only allowed to be 10 minutes long or, or something else or you've had to give a lesson. Um, but for us, it's that we have to kind of fit it into a like a three or four minute song which rhymes you know and and I think those things can be really challenging and we do we've done a lot of I think we spend a big chunk of our time talking about the the trade-off between kind of detail and accuracy and accessibility to a, a specifically a young audience mm. um, and we spend a lot of time reading primary school curricula uh, talking to teachers and asking them about kind of how the way the way kids learn and 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 you know having a lot of debate we have a lot of debates about is this is this fact that we're kind of slightly s simplifying uh, are we doing that in a truthful way to the science um mm. so yeah we think about that a lot so is your hope overall then um was your plan originally to take this to, to schools and stuff or what was your hope in terms of who would see it and what they would take away from it? Yeah, so so we so we we've written this is kind of our biggest thing that we've written this this hour long musical and we haven't taken this to schools, but we've definitely been into schools with other bits and bobs that we've written and little little shows about um, smaller kind of less. Um, like le less mammoth uh, discoveries necessarily. Um, so we, we have been into schools, but we'd love to take this into schools, but sometimes it's a little bit difficult to kind of make it portable. And yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And all the tech side of things as well. Just, But we're, we're hoping to sort of expand this and uh, take this musical to various different places. And uh, we're developing various different things um, that we've got on the go at the moment. And, and I guess we... In, as just sort of a general point about what we hope people will get sort of take from it as well as the, the sort of science itself 
is um, we, we think it's really important to try and show people what the scientific process itself is about. Mm -hmm. So like in the What Killed the Dinosaurs show, we're not actually that bothered whether people know what killed the dinosaurs. That's not the important thing. <laughs> it's more important that they see how those um, theories and those discoveries came about. And it's quite an interesting story with two different hypotheses and how they're sort of different bits of evidence point towards different ones and we hope that uh, the kids and the adults will take away that science is something and the scientific process is something that can be trusted uh, but also the limitations of it that we're always at the next best guess and we're keeping striving forward to try and get the next best thing. Yeah definitely and I suppose also it being musical and creative maybe it, uh, appeals to a different group of people as well so, so might turn to some others into to being interested in science yeah, we um, so. yeah. great so um we have someone saying can we hear the next verse of i think that was the the dino song i don't oh. know if you want to play another verse i, I mean i can yeah i can do the um so we have a i mean this is this is actually quite quite exciting this is actually a deleted scene um Ooh, from from the musical exclusive we, uh, yeah we, it, it it got too long and we realized that we were having a bit too many reprises of things coming back so um in the middle of the uh of the show when we've got these two competing ideas about the deccan traps which are these big volcanoes and the meteorite um spoilers um they uh we sort of sum that up in a an, in a little um chorus and that i guess it sort of sums up the show uh, as as it is. Here we go. Uh, what really killed the dinosaurs? Was it the deck and traps or a meteor? Right now we're not sure, so we'll have to find out more. Where will the evidence lead? Which theory will succeed? What really killed the dinosaurs? Yeah. I should say thank you, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be stuck in my head for the rest of the day. That's the hope. That's, that's yeah, what we want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's good. Uh, well, look, thank you to for joining us. It's really great. Are you online as Geologized Theatre? Like, where can people go to to hear and see more? Um, yes, we're on Twitter at We Are Geologized. And we'll also have a YouTube channel, which is just Geologized Theatre. And there are some, not very many, but there are some videos on there which we filmed during the lockdown because a lot of our live shows that we were going to be doing were, were have been cancelled. Mm -hmm. So instead we filmed some of those and hopefully, we hope there should be some more content on there like fairly soon. So watch that space. Brilliant. Well, I'll just say thank you uh, to both of you again and, and thanks for those who have been watching. Um, as you know, we're doing these every Tuesday and Thursday, these live Q&As. Uh, our next one is on Thursday at 5.30pm with uh, Clara Barker, who's a material scientist. Uh, she works on superconductors and, and all sorts of cool things. And she did a podcast with us a while back called Where's My Hoverboard? So maybe you can go back and listen to that. And then next week, we're going to be talking all things Parkinson's and the best ways to quit smoking too. Uh, maybe not one for the kids, that one. But um, th thank you both again. Thank you so much. And for the music. Uh, and Thanks. if you haven't checked them out, do it. Subscribe to us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.